My name is then Gunnar Sletta. I'm a Norwegian working at, uh, as a software developer at Trolltech. I've been with Trolltech for around three years. And during that time, I've been uh, responsible for the QSA project, which is Qt scripting for applications, script bindings for Qt. Uh, and also the two last years, I've been uh, one of the main developers on the Qt4 painting subsystem called Arthur. And uh, at least, how many of you guys do graphics or have done graphics at some point in time? Was it fun? <laughs> yeah. Mostly graphics is a bit, a bit cool, so at least I like that project quite a bit. So today's goals. Um, we're going to split it into two, sec two sections. The first half, um, I'm going to go through a demo where I, where I have complex drawing, as I call it. You have lots and lots of items. In my case, I have one million. Uh, and still, while having a lot of items, you want to have snappy scrolling, be able to have smooth scrolling up and down. You want items to show up on screen fairly quickly. You don't want seconds of delays for stuff to happen. In addition, you want to have like modern rubber bands, transparent on top, being able, being able to select things nicely. And as, as we go along, I'll start with an, un, an unoptimized demo, then move on to add some tricks, add some, uh, some simple routines to make it faster and better. And then the second half is uh, what I call the Hitchhiker's Guide to Arthur a small uh, collection of tips and tricks that you might benefit from when you're doing graphics programming. And even though you're not doing a million items yourself, anything that you can do in your application to speed up drawing is most likely a good thing because it's time that your application can spend doing other things like processing the data that you should be processing. So what are the obstacles here? Uh, many may say that, like, a million items, that's not a problem. I can just brute force, draw everything, and it's not a problem. But it turns out that it is. Um, for GDI, for instance, there's a max limit of around half a million items per second. You cannot draw more than half a million tri or rectangles or triangles per second. That's as fast as you can do uh, the kernel or the GDI calls. And it's the same for the image engine that we have in Qt 401. The limit is around half a, million, half a million items per second. So there is a limit. And if you want to do a million items, smooth scrolling, that's like updates of less than 50 milliseconds, the numbers don't add up. So we need to do something else. So then show my demo, and uh, we'll see how it works. The demo is sort of like it could be a chip design thing. At least it has some small transistors on it. So we'll see. Generating a bit of data first, takes a bit of time, then it comes up. Initial uh, time here is one and a half millisecond. If I try to zoom a little bit, something happens, but it's still, it's really slow, right? And how this works is that I have a loop going through all the items, calling the paint function, which sets a pen, sets a brush for that item, and then draw calls draw on it. Simply like straightforward, no optimizations at all. Total items is one million, and I draw everything. And of course, this does not work. It's, uh, it's not good enough. What then? Anybody have any suggestions? Obvious things I should do. Exactly. Most of my data is not visible at this point. I only have a small part, right? So I need to determine what part of my data set is visible at any given time, and I need to throw away everything else. That's the first thing I should do. Anything else? I think there's a picture task you could use to speed up uh, several uh, vector drawing uh, operations. Q picture. Unless I'm mistaken. Q picture doesn't optimize anything. It just it's just it's just a, a, a sort of a, a box where you can put painting commands and then you just replay them. It doesn't merge uh, the the coins for the painting engine or anything. No, it's just it's just a meta file format or meta paint command set. Hmm? A painter path. Painter path will or could be the solution in the future. We don't we don't move those to the graphics part. That's that's an alternative. OpenGL is faster than GDI. 
definitely. But if the stuff changes all the time, then I can't do that. It's a huge widget. It's like 10,000 pixels large. The answer is there now. So we'll, go, we go, we'll, we'll keep on going. The point is that what if, my, if all my data is visible? I zoom out and I see one million items. I can't, I can't view this anyway. It's too much data. So I can simplify it by, by stripping the outline so that the fill of the shapes is visible instead. So to keep, keep in focus what the overall view. So you, just, you can simplify stuff by throwing it away. How many of you have uh, played like Grand Theft Auto or um, played with Google Earth? Yeah. As you zoom in out of stuff, you will see that the, the shapes, the geometry of the, of the landscape simplifies. There's less and less triangles. It gets flat when you go far enough out. This is simplification, level of detail. So first of all, visibility determination. In my sort of image there I have, I have a high... Um, high quality data set of Norway. I'm viewing uh, part of uh, one of the Norwegian fjords on the side, and it's only this part that I'm interested in. The rest of the data is, is irrelevant. So what I, uh, what I can do is I can, I can based on the geometric locality of my data, I can decide quickly that everything above that fjord I can discard, everything below it I can discard, everything on the side I can discard. And quickly, I'm, I'm, I'm then, uh, I sit back with just a minor, data, minor piece of the data set. Say, for instance, 1%. And if I can reduce it to 1% by just uh, applying some algorithms, that means that I get 100 times speed up because I draw only 100th. And techniques that you typically use for this is you can do sorting, so you can binary search for the first and last item. You can do domain decomposition, split your, your data sets into domains, uh, do recursively division. There are a number of different techniques. How many people use these techniques already? Quite a few. That's good. And then if you have these techniques in place, you can make use of it. When you are scrolling, then the, and you call Q widget colon colon scroll, we will actually copy parts of the widget just a few pixels up. And we only issue a repaint for the area below, for this small segment down there. And through the QPaint event rect function or region, I can actually access this rectangle. And I can then clip to the exposed region, figure out I only need to repaint this small segment down here, and then I have even less to draw. So continuously just throwing out stuff that I don't need to draw. If you're doing stuff um, that triggers updates by yourself, you're, for instance, moving items around, uh, to moves from here to here, you also can only, you can re uh, limit the update region to as small a segment as possible. If you're only moving up here, only update up here, because then the, uh, the clipping algorithm that you have will clip stuff away. And same with selections, for instance. It's the, it's the same thing. You, you should minimize whatever you update. So then I have the demo part two. Now I'll also walk a little bit through the code. <coughs> My shapes, fairly trivial. I have, I set the pen, I set the brush, and I draw a rectangle. In my paint event function, open a painter, clear it, and I call this function find the visible band. I use a Y directional sorting here, so all my items are sorted based on their Y coordinate. And I want to find the Y start and the Y stop. And assuming that this function gives me just that, I can go into my loop, which goes through these. And just to avoid having to set the, the pen and the brush, because that's a, that's a minor state change, but it costs just a little bit, I also abort uh, if I'm not hitting the X band. The Y band gives me sort of this narrow horizontal band, 
but I also want to clip away the X chunks. And then I call paint on the item here. So I recompile, see how that works. And now you see it's it's a tiny bit faster, just a little bit. And the benefit you can see down here, I have one million items. It's 1,500 items in my band. Nobody can see this, right? Um, okay. Items in this horizontal band now is 100 or 1,500 items. That's roughly 1,000. Of, uh, of what I have. I'm poor with math, sorry. And then the actual items that I draw in the last redraw are only 38 because I just had a scroll of a few pixels and there was only a few items in that segment. So I draw that, I drew 38 items and it took me zero milliseconds. So scrolling then works pretty fine. Uh, my repaint time now is about, it's uh, between one, 10 and 20 milliseconds. So that's pretty fine. Does it try to hide? That's the trick, because as you can see now, as I'm zooming out, the speed increases because I'm drawing more and more. Now I'm up to 7,000 items in my last redraw. The repaint time now is 71 milliseconds. If I go a little bit further out, it's 120 milliseconds. So apparently this is, this is where I'm drawing more and more data, and my first technique does not work or it does not solve everything for me, it solves one problem. Actually, I also have, I wanted to show selection. I also have the ability to do this. And the reason for that, I do the same trick with the find visible band in my mouse uh, handling. When I, when I want to do intersection tests for which, I, which item my selection rectangle is intersecting with, I do the same thing. I mark all previously selected items as not selected. I find the visible band, and within this visible band, I do an intersection check. So I only, I, only do, I only check for intersection in this area. So even selection can, can take, make benefit of, the, of this, uh, this Y sorting. Some of you may ask why this is not in Qpainter. Any ideas? It should be in Qpainter, right? What about you? Yeah. You should say that you must not create all the items of the users for the two tank, but to then create or two the uh, data you uh, want to draw. You don't have to put all the data to two tank. No, I don't. Exactly. Uh, the point is that QPainter works on a per item basis. Of course, QPainter can throw away any individual item as you call draw rect. It decides that, yep, yeah, this rectangle is, is definitely outside. I don't draw this and then the next one comes, and then the next one comes, and then the next one comes. But my find visible band function does a binary search from top to bottom. That's like 10 comparisons for, uh, for 1 million items. So of course, doing 10 comparisons is significantly faster than, than trying to draw 100,000 items. So the main reason for that is then that QPainter is per item based. QPainter has no information about your data set at all. So you sit with the knowledge that we do not have, so you can make decisions and, uh, and clip based on your data. That brings us to visibility determination, or at the end of that. Um, visibility determination, as we see now, is useful when data is partially visible. You only have repaints of a small chunk of it. You use the knowledge you have on the data, and you repaint only what you need. As we zoomed out, we saw that this does not give us everything, or it starts to get slower. <coughs> uh, 
as we are zooming out, we're hitting some, some, of, some physical boundaries or some problems that if I have one million items and my screen is, say, 1600 by 1200 display, I have around two million pixels on that screen. And one million items leaves two pixels per item. And at least that's usually not very clear what that image means or that, what that display means. The data, it's just too much data on the screen. So what, so what you need to do then is to reduce complexity. And I also have this image on the side there where you have this, this Norwegian fjord again as a fairly complex polygon. And then as you zoom out, you don't see the details anyway, so you can might as well just ignore it. And you can ignore it by simply, either you can take this complex polygon, make it into just a line in and a line out, to just outline the shape of it, and if it's far enough out, you can just take the whole thing away. So uh, you can simplify polygons. Other things you can do is you can simplify shapes, like ellipses, to rectangles, or to even to points, because an ellipse is, if it's 100 by 100 pixels, it's a nice, smooth circle. If it's at 4 by 4 pixels, it's this, like, this squarish block on screen. If it's at 3 by 3 pixels or 2 by 2 pixels, it will mostly look like a rectangle anyway, so you might as well just call draw rect. And if it's smaller than that, you can just simply do draw point. And also, as you're zooming out, many of your shapes can be just excluded. If you have thin lines, uh, as you're zooming out of your data, the thin lines are probably not uh, that, that relevant anymore, so you can just take them out. And the same is, uh, can be done for fills or outlines. Drawing an outline using a pen is significantly more expensive than using a fill. So if you're, look, if you're seeing performance problems uh, using pens, you might consider skipping them. Fills you can skip if they are for the same reasons as everything else, basically, that when they don't matter anymore, you don't need to draw them anymore. And we also have this, this uh, difference between cosmetic pens and real pens. A, um, a cosmetic pen is a pen that is uh, defined to be of width zero. We always draw this as a one pixel thick line, no matter how you scale it. A normal pen, if you set it to be one pixel wide, as you zoom in by a factor 10, this line will be blown up to be 10 pixels wide. It is mostly, it's more efficient to draw a cosmetic pen because we can use a simple Brazenham algorithm, for instance, to just plot this, this, these pixels. While with the real pen, we have to do some vector um, magic on it. So if you are seeing problems, you might want to consider switching to a cosmetic pen rather than a real pen. The problem with cosmetic pens is that they stay one pixel wide no matter how much you scale. So as you're zooming out of your data, you will see that as the fill gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the, the outline stays the same, the same size. It's always one pixel wide. So as you're zooming out and your rectangle comes down to two pixels, then you still have this, this, this outline of, of uh, three pixels around it. So the, the pen will outweigh the fill as you're zooming out. So it's another, another case where you're actually cluttering your data with something that should probably not be there. Other things you can do is to simplify solid color, simplify complex fills to solid colors, making use uh, of texture fills, pick snaps and gradients and alphas. You can map these into solid colors. And I've tried to make my point with the gradient on the side there. There is a gradient on the big one. On the low one is just the average color. And at that distance, it's mostly not visible. If you're doing pixel map transformation, you can either doing, do them in, with smooth transformations or with just uh, non-smooth transformations. And of course, smooth transformations are slower than non-smooth transformations. So if you're, if you're zooming fast in and out, you might want to turn off smooth transformation while you are zooming and then turn it back on again 
will last when the user stops interacting. Then you do a second redraw uh, with with smooth transformations to get it like nice. So it's a bit coarse while you're zooming, but then it gets nice afterwards. And if you have really complex shapes, like in this small area you have, you have something that takes a lot of time to draw, you might want to consider caching this small segment in a pix map and then just scale this up and down. So I will then, uh, I will then do the demo last time, and now I've added a level of detail part to my, to my code where I strip or I skip outlines and, uh, and those line segments over a certain threshold. And I also uh, simplify the selection a little bit. So I go into the shape file, take out this. Now what this does is that it, it takes away the pen at a certain, certain threshold. And in my paint event, sorry, let me see. I do the same thing. If the scale factor is at a certain threshold, I just skip this item. And then the, the limit is coded per item. So how does that work? Same, the same speed here. And as I zoom out, you see that stuff starts to disappear. And it's still fairly smooth. And then at the end, we see just the overview. So level of detail, more, or you have much data visible on the screen at, at any time. You need to make what is there more clear. You want to focus on the, on like the overviews. So you simplify what you draw. Then uh, my transparent rubber bands. Transparent rubber bands is sort of is a thing that has been pretty uh, turned into something very common now. Uh, it's done on all the modern operating systems. When you do selections, you want you want this nice blue rubber band. It it gives you no rendering artifacts as you can quickly get if you use XOR. Um, but how do you do this? The, the the common approach is just to to set a state while you're dragging your mouse around. And you can look in the hand, code handouts, how it's done. Basically, on mouse press, you set, I'm now doing starting selection. You update the mouse point while you're moving, and then you're calling update, continuously calling update um, on the area that you're currently selecting. And then in the repaint event, you know that I'm in the selection state, and you call a special rubber band handling call. So it just, just redraws the stuff under it, and then paints the selection on top. And if, if this is not fast enough, you can cache whatever is on your display in a pix map, because pix map drawing, if it is an opaque pix map, getting it that to screen is really fast. So it's it's close to spontaneous. Now one benefit of this is that chances are that you're issuing quite a lot more mouse move events than you can do repaints. Uh, at any given time. So if, by calling update, you will actually let the system, uh, let the windowing system issue an update uh, on a regular basis rather than having to repaint, 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 repaint for every single mouse move. So you can actually save a quite a few uh, repaints by issuing updates to yourself as part of the mouse move event instead of just calling repaint. So that's the, that concludes the first half of the talk. The second half is then the sort of tips, tips and tricks section. This is mostly related to Qt4 programming or to Arthur. So how many of you have, have actually tried out the Qt4 painting subsystem? Not so many. It's pretty cool. Uh, first thing uh, to make um, to look at is we have two draw text functions in Cube in Cube Painter. One that takes a rectangle, one that takes a cube point. One of them does a full text layout. You can do alignment and mapping, mapping it to top, uh, left, bottom, right, clipping, and everything. It's it does full formatting and is 
it's two to four times slower than the straightforward one that you can use or do using a draw text with just a point. So if you know the position where the text should be, you should use draw point or draw the text that takes a cube point. So transparency. This is a new feature we have in Qt4, or at least we had some transparency in Qt3 as well, but in Qt4 we have transparency for everything. And it's not free. Because a, um, a normal, when you're just writing a pixel at an, as, solid, as a solid color, it's just write this pixel there. When you're doing transparency, you actually have to read the pixel uh, from the source or from the destination, take the source pixel, do some calculations, and write the new pixel down. So it's both read and write, and it's, it's a bit more complicated. On average, it's like six to eight times slower than a normal solid. So it's often, or it, it's a bit of a waste. If you know the background color, uh, then you can pre-calculate what kind of transparency value you will draw over this. For instance, if you're just drawing, hovering over tool, uh, tool buttons, and you just want them to be like a bit darker, then you can just get your dark color rather than drawing a semi-transparent black rectangle on top of that, just as an example. And Sometimes you can also, if the transparency value is close to transparent or close to opaque, you can just either draw it as a solid or skip it. It depends on the, on the detail that you actually want. The second point here is, uh, is a problem that is, it's easy to run into. Um, it's that if you have an ARGB image, an image that is defined to have an alpha channel, such as you open it in Photoshop or in, in GIMP or whatever you use, and you create this image to have a transparent background. And then you draw on top of this, and by the time you finish with this image, you've filled every single pixel. And then you save it to, to file as a PNG that has an alpha channel. And in the file format, it still says that this image has an alpha channel, even though you don't use any pixels, or you don't use any transparency for any other pixels, but it's still there. And Qt also does not detect this. So when you're drawing this, this image or pix map onto the screen, we still draw this as if it would have an alpha channel. So drawing this image would then be six to eight times slower than drawing it as an opaque. So if you know that you're loading opaque images, make sure that they actually are opaque. And you can do this in Qt4 by calling QImage convert to format and convert it into an RGB32 image, for instance. Can take questions later. Then the last thing is, um, is um, some issues we've seen with XRender. How many use XRender? One. Yeah, and Roberto. <laughs> Um, what you might see if you deploy your applications on X11 on machines that, uh, that have XRender and a decent graphics card but that don't have an accelerated driver for XRender is that it's, it just works really, really slow. And um, we are working on this issue. You can talk to Zach here if you have questions about it. But since nobody uses XRender here, I'm just going to skip the, the reason for it. So pens and outlines. As I said before, pens are, or outlines are, complex, are significantly more complex than fills. It's at least twice as many points because it's like one, it's one for each side. And it's, uh, it's also more complex. If you have rounded edges, we need to do curve uh, approximations. If you have mitre joints and you need to like find intersection points to where stuff uh, over edges start and stop. So outlines are more expensive. So be aware of that when you're drawing. And if you know that you're only drawing horizontal or vertical lines, you might get away with drawing just uh, small rectangles instead of the appropriate width, because this is faster. You don't get all these details around it. And then it's the width equals zero, the cosmetic pens. These are usually faster. 
uh, almost all engines have a fast path or faster path for that special case. The only exception is the Mac engine. Then it's the OpenGL paint engine. As was suggested, if you want it to be a little bit faster, <clears throat> you can use OpenGL. Uh, since Qt4, we have the ability to open a Qt Painter on a QGL widget. This means that Qt Painter will be most likely hardware accelerated, depending on the driver and the graphics card you have underneath. This means that you will have faster alpha blending, faster primitive drawing, you have faster anti-aliasing, slightly worse quality, but still faster, and you also have faster transformations. You have faster PixMap drawing and PixMap scaling and everything. It just gets faster and faster. And in uh, Qt 4.1, they've done significant amount of improvements, both uh, quality-wise and performance-wise, to the OpenGL paint engine. So since 4.1, you should be able to just move, uh, move the base class of your widget to a QGL widget, and painting will look the same and will be just faster. The only sort of downside to it is that if you're drawing a lot of pix maps on a QGL widget, we need to transfer these pix map from like the X server or from our uh, image buffers in Windows and move them into texture memory. This is a bit of a slow operation, so we try to cache them as textures, textures on the graphics card, but we can only we can only cache it if it's the same image. So if you're drawing uh, a new image all the time, then you will not get any speed up by using this engine. So QPainter path. QPainter path is, uh, is a vector path definition. So it's, it's the, the, the graphical primitives primitive that can be used for any kind of drawing. It, uh, it's what is commonly used uh, to represent fonts. Those are vector definitions. And a, and a path contains then lines and curves. And because it is a vector definition, to transform this is very fast. Because it's just the points, and it's for, uh, for any other points, I just multiply it with the matrix. If you compare this to a Q region, which is the closest uh, comparison we had for Q3, which is also what you, can, what you used for clipping in Q3, it's um, a Q region, when you transform this, you take each of the rectangles in a Q region, and then you sort of transform each rectangle into a set of new rectangles, and then you merge this with the, what came out of any of the other transformations of the rectangles. So you, you can end up with like this, the, um, your rightmost image there, which is just a band of lots of rectangles. While the painter path, you just transform the border points, and then you end up with something that looks exactly the same. It's just rotated. And if you have there like a hippopotamus, then you can see like a complex shape, turn it into, it's probably like a thousand rectangles by starting, rotate it, and it's even, even more. So it's, it's faster because, it, because it's just the points and it's more precise. So if you're doing clipping and have transformations, use Q Painter Path, definitely. Another alternative for Painter Paths is to do fancy text effects, like gradient texts and alpha texts, or, um, or text deformation, like, like bump wrapping the text like, like around a sphere or something. You can also use QPainter path for this, but you need to be aware of that adding a text to a path, like extracting the glyphs from the fonts, is a fairly expensive operation because fetching the font data from whatever font server we have on the, on the given system is a bit of an operation. We're looking into caching techniques there, but we're not there yet. And if you're doing text rotation um, in QPainter, you are likely to hit the add text path. So rotation of text can be a bit slow. So if you're seeing this, 
you can try to extract the path yourself and just cache the path and redraw the path, because drawing a path is very fast. Duh. This is like um, something that everybody knows. Allocations are bad. Avoid it if possible. In Qt 4.0, there were quite a lot of allocations still in the painter's code path inside of QPainter. We tried to avoid this now. So that this should only happen in, in um, uncommon cases, like esoteric use of QPainter. But it's also something that can happen um, on your side um, if there are things that you don't know about, such as if you're calling set pen and set brush, um, the version that take a Q namespace uh, version, cute colon colon black, cute colon colon red, or if you call set pen with cute colon colon dot line, then this actually behind the scenes will create a pen for you, a pen. And the pen is a shared object, so it has a D pointer, so it has an object behind it. So that's actually one allocation there. So if you're inside some loop, just calling set black, set black, set black, you're actually doing one allocation for each iteration in that loop. So it's something to be aware of. The other thing is, when you're working with polygons, a Q polygon or a Q point array in three is a, um, is a list of points. As you're adding points, as you're adding points, you start up with like Q point array or Q polygon, something, some polygon, and then you add points to this. If this is a long polygon or a large polygon, say 50 items, then as you're adding items, this, this object will actually start resizing itself dynamically to accommodate the size that you're, the size that you want it to be. So it will probably resize at, start out with a size of like 16 elements, then resize to 32, then resize again to have 64. I don't remember the exact algorithm used for resizing, but it resizes continuously if you're just adding items. So, so, so a trick there to minimize the damage or to minimize the allocations is to use a function called qpolygon uh, Q colon colon reserve. This is actually a function in qvector. So this, is, this applies to any kind of vector operation you do. If you want to add tons of items to to one of our vector classes or to a vector subclass, you can reserve space. That means that you set aside, my polygon will be X number of elements long, reserve the size, just fill it up, and you get away with only one allocation. That is quite an improvement over three. Now the other alternative is something you can use if you know the amount of points you have and you have them as Q points already. Nobody can see this again, I see. QPainter has, since Qt4, a overload of draw polygon that takes a C pointer to a Q point. So if you know that you're drawing triangles or rectangles or quads, then you can put these on the stack as a C array and pass the reference to QPainter and the number of elements and you will actually have no allocations in that code path at all. Another thing that you can be aware of is that the complexity of um, any object affects its rasterization time. Typically, rasterization involves some kind of sorting, so at least it's n log n. So if you are, if I have a polygon that has 1,000 points in it, it is significantly slower to draw than than some than 10 polygons that have 100 elements in it. And just to make uh, a simple example, if you do add text, and you have you pass add text a long long string, then you will get a fairly complex path out of that because each character normally has some eight to 20 uh, curves in it. Like an O, for example, has uh, eight curves in it. And that probably expands to something like 50, 60 line segments 
for, uh, for a normal font to get it smooth enough. So if you just expand that number to a whole, a whole string or a whole, whole sentence, you get a fairly complex polygon you want to rasterize. So what you can do is you can then split this up into words or even into just, uh, into just um, letters and draw them individually, and this will be significantly faster. In, uh, in Qt4, we have the concept of QPainter backends. We call them, QPain we call them paint engines. And each, uh, each uh, individual sort of graphics representation has a different engine. So OpenGL has, a different, has an engine. We have the native engines, which are the X11, the core graphics engine on Mac. We have the software engine, QImage. And we have made QPainter so that if an engine, an engine doesn't support a given feature, then we try to, to emulate this as much as possible. What happens then is that you will, get, you will get this image rasterized using our reference implementation, which is a software engine. And then we convert, then you get an image back, and then we draw this image. So feature emulation is, there's a quite a bit of overhead per operation there. But the point is that what you see on screen is what you expect to see on screen. So if a feature is not supported, you can expect that operation to be very slow. And the feature set of any engine is public knowledge. You can query the painter for its current engine and ask it if it has a certain feature, like brush transformations or uh, Porter Duff operations or something like that. So if you're seeing that you're hitting a, a, uh, a software emulation, you might want to try how it works if you're just painting onto a QImage. Because QImage is a reference implementation. It's a software engine that supports everything. That means that you have no intermediate images being created and discarded and rendered into and then transferring this temporary image onto the X server and stuff like that. It's just all in software, local memory, and it is fairly fast, as long as you're working on just this one image. So if you're seeing severe problems uh, using gradients, for instance, try it with QImage, see how that works instead, and if it turns out to work better, then just use it. So that is uh, basically what I had to say today. We looked a bit about complex drawing, how to use visibility determination and level of detail, to speed up, um, to speed up uh, algorithms, or to add algorithms to speed up complex drawing. And then we went through some simple tricks and tips and tricks. There's more information on the link there. That's the overview document for Arthur. And I think we have the time for a little bit of questions. In this new Q paint engine, uh, you have the you have the any 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 paintable object is still a cube paint device, and that's actually where you implement the engine. So paint engine is a virtual function in cube paint device, so you can access. So when you open a painter on a, on any device, it queries it for its paint engine and then starts painting on it. So a cube printer has all the features of Qt4, except alpha blending because printers have an issue with alpha blending. And then, um, I mean, it just works. And you can also, uh, you can also extend and write your own backends by just subclassing QPaint device and implementing your own engine, like uh, a PDF generator. Yeah, oh, sorry. If I draw a line um, over an open gel widget with a QPainter, uh, is it um, drawn with OpenGL techniques, or is it an overlay to the frame buffer? It's drawn using OpenGL techniques, but um, there are some steps in between, okay. such as uh, doing dotted lines with a certain width that are scaled accordingly, because OpenGL basically has a line width, and that's the line width you get, even if you assume it's the same line width, right? Mm -hmm. So we have we actually support like vector lines, so they scale and everything. So there. 
depending on the state of the painter, uh, you will get a direct or indirect path to open gel calls. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Quick one. Can I query the OpenGL uh, paint engine to find out whether it's hardware accelerated or not? No, I don't think so. Could you add that? <laughs> <laughs> that would be a thing. That would be a feature of the QGL uh, QGL uh, classes. You can query actually. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to just figure out at runtime which option should I be using? Should I use OpenGL or should I fall back to say Core Graphics? Hmm. You should mostly use OpenGL. Anyway. I haven't I haven't seen a, a Mac yet where the OpenGL engine is performs worse than the core graphics stuff anyway. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Uh, I can I can. Yeah. No, I, it's a definite point. I'll mark it down. Yeah, another question on the OpenGL stuff. Do you use display lists or is it possible to use display lists? We don't use display lists at the moment, Zach. Yeah, I mean, technically on the, on the driver side, we're moving away from using display lists. They're, they're great, uh, but the bottom line is the only reason display lists are, are good because you store the data uh, that you want to be pushing on the server side. What we do on the drivers, we use very proper objects now, so we're moving away from the display list. The reason we're moving away from the display list on the driver side is because the complex rendering that was done on this playlist is interfering when you have a couple of display lists. Can I get the mic? Can you get the microphone? Yeah. Can you get that, Zach? <laughs> 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 Zach, come uh, Sorry, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Zach. I'm working on drivers on Max and on a couple of other platforms. Uh, so, uh, Driver side, we're moving away from using display list. They're a great concept. It's just they were too limited for a lot of purposes that uh, people need in complex rendering, especially now that we're moving the metaphor of OpenGL from games to desktop. The difference is that on the on the desktop, you need high quality output rendering. On games, you were not getting that because people were cutting the corners. So we're moving away from display list to, to vertex buffer objects. So on, on our OpenGL engine, uh, we're moving towards vertex buffer objects that rather than display list. The other advantage is that you also get that on OpenGL embedded. You don't get that stuff on OpenGL embedded, so our painter, which is which we want to share for OpenGL embedded and for OpenGL, is going to be using greater buff, buffer objects, and that's what I would recommend you also switch to. Time for one more question. That's what you first. It's probably not fair, but there we go. Just a question to the future. Uh, Windows Vista is standing in front of us. How does uh, OpenGL will work with the Vista restrictions? Since there is some rumors that they will switch off OpenGL if you make full use of the Vista fe features. What Microsoft will actually do in that regards, we don't really know. What they said is that they will layer OpenGL on top of Direct3D, which means that it will probably be a little bit slower than what it is today. But what we will do in uh, Trolltech is to uh, introduce a Direct3D-based painting subsystem layer on top of Direct3D, so you will actually get full hardware acceleration without OpenGL as well. So the selection 
asked before will be much more interesting even in the future. Hmm? The, the possibility to query ask, to query for yes. the no, drawing system which is available yeah. we'll, is uh, we'll, needed. We'll note that feature suggestion down and uh, see what we can do. Okay, that's, uh, that's it. Thank yeah. you for your time.